So we're at 10 o'clock and I think we should get started. Um, we're going to cut me off if my audio starts to cut out, but I'm going to give just a general introduction before we get going. So good morning, everybody. Welcome to the Your Fields, Your Results findings from the on-farm research trials across Manitoba webinar hosted by both Manitoba Pulse and Soybean Growers and Manitoba Crop Alliance. Uh, thank you to everyone who's in attendance with us right now. We normally do share the results of the, our on-farm trials with trial participants in an in-person event, and we do hope to get back to that next year. So the goal of these trials is to one, work directly with producers to conduct controlled replicated trials on their own farm for their own farm. Two, to enable producers to perform similar trials independently if they prefer. Three, to help make producers more profitable, profitable through research that can pr provide real returns. And finally, four, to create a network and system so that producers have the capability um, to implement research trials on their own farm. We wanna be expanding on small plot research and adding to the information that we get from those small plot studies. So between Manitoba Pulse and Soybean Growers and MCA, we have on-farm trials in barley, corn, sunflowers, dry beans, faba beans, uh, peas, soybeans, and spring wheat. If you or anyone you know is interested in getting involved with any of our on-farm trials, we would be more than happy to chat with you about it and get, um, and you can contact our representative office offices for more information. So before I introduce our first speaker, there are just a couple housekeeping items that everyone's likely super familiar with by now. On the bottom of your screen, you see a chat box um, where you can type any comments or observations during the webinar um, and everyone can interact in this spot. There's also a separate question and answer box that we would like you to use to direct your questions to our presenters. We're going to get through three presentations this morning and then have a question and answer session at the end of the webinar. So I'll ask that you, um, or I'll ask that our presenters um, wait till the end and we'll answer all questions at once. Finally, the presentations are gonna be recorded and posted to both the Manitoba Pulse and Manitoba Crop Alliance websites. So with that, I think we are ready to begin. Um, I'm going to start with Laura Schmidt, who is a production specialist with Manitoba Pulse and Soybean Growers. With that, Laura, please take it away. All right. Good morning, everybody. Um, just looking for a verbal thumbs up that you can hear me okay? You're good to go, Laura. Awesome. Good morning. So my internet is such that I cannot share audio and camera at the same time. So here's a little picture of my face. Uh, I'm really glad to be here today to talk about results from our on-farm research program. I'm Laura, the Western agronomist for MPSG. Here's a quick overview of what we're going to cover in about 30 minutes here. Um, I've highlighted a couple trial types I'd like to focus in on a bit more. As well, we'd like to update you on what's new with the network. First of all, we'd like to welcome a new on-farm network agronomist to MPSG. Leanne Carossel's joined our team. She grew up in Sandy Lake and recently finished her master's at the U of M. So if you see her out in your field this season, please introduce yourself and give her a warm welcome. Also new this year is a two page guide to conducting on farm trials on your farm. So it walks through everything from forming a research question and selecting treatments to how to get meaningful trial results. So the on farm network is also here to help answer those questions and aid in trial setup, data collection and analysis. And this resource can be downloaded at our website you can find it by Googling MPSG on-farm trial guide, or if you'd like a hard copy, please feel free to reach out to us after this talk. MPSG has been running on-farm trials since 2012, and the on-farm network was created officially in 2014. So we've been at on-farm research for about 10 years now, and you can see how our program has expanded each year in this animated map showing yearly trial locations. The on-farm network is fully funded and directed by Manitoba Pulse and Soybean Farmers, so it really is a by farmers for farmers research program. And the goal here is to test new products and practices for production in a way that's going to empower farmers to conduct straightforward and reliable research on their farms. So we've now conducted more than 400 trials across Manitoba, and this is just a breakdown of those trials by crop type, so mainly soybean so far, but we are actively expanding into the pulses. 
what that looks like in terms of trial types, these are the range of questions we've kind of investigated over the last 10 years. The little numbers beside each trial type are the number of trials of each type to date. So some are one-off farmer questions, while many are building larger data sets. There's everything on here from plant establishment type questions to fertility, fungicides, biologicals, and more. Uh, one example of a larger data set is soybean seeding rates, which hit 100 trials this year. There were also a few new trial types in the pulses, uh, so investigating pea inoculant and seeding rates, which we're going to dive into a little bit more detail. But before I get into it too much, I just want to make you aware that for the last two years, Megan has created these short YouTube videos summarizing the results of each trial type. So they're going to cover the agronomics of relevance to each trial and do some math to see if the economics penciled out for those that did have a significant yield response. So we had a couple new trial types that I mentioned. Uh, we also had some really interesting results in some of our driving trials. So those are a couple of the things you can look forward to in more detail in these videos. And they're going to be available on our website at that link and also on our YouTube channel. Alongside that, we also have an on-farm report database. So all of the reports for the 418 trials we've conducted can be found on our website. You can find it by searching NPSG OFN database. So this is a screenshot of the top of that database. And you can filter down results by the crop you're interested in, the year, uh, trial type, or region. Um, you can also scroll down past that filter and uh, select by the map. So in that map, you can zoom into areas of interest. You can select trials based on their little uh, pop-up dingle thing. And it'll pop up a kind of summary of what the trial type was, crop treatments, as well as a link to the full report for more information. And then if you scroll past that map after filtering results, you'll find a table of those results as well. So here I filtered by soybean double versus single inoculant trials. We've got year, region, more information into those treatments, if there was a yield difference. And then again, that link to the full report. Uh, if the yield cell is highlighted in green, that means it was a statistically significant yield difference. All of these others, though there was a, a difference we could report, um, since it's not significant, the treatment difference was effectively zero for those trials. So let's get into this last growing season. For the 2021 season specifically, we harvested 54 trials across four crop types and about 16 different trial types or types of questions. So here we have a map of where those trials were by crop on top of the percent normal precipitation from May to the end of October. So I know this map is a little misleading since the majority of the rain that did come came in August, but it's really helping illustrate the main story or the main point I wanna get across, which is that the main story of 2021 is gonna be that moisture really drove the results or the lack thereof this season. And these are some of the broader trial types we conducted this last year. So inoculant seeding rates, row spacings and more. We were still able to have some fungicide trials this year, uh, but that number was certainly walked back a bit. Um, I'd like to briefly cover results from each trial type with a bit more of a deeper dive into soybean row spacing, pea seeding rate, and driving nitrogen and tillage. So starting with soybeans, in soybean biological trials, we had three trials comparing ohm versus untreated and one comparing primacy alpha versus untreated. So we had no significant yield responses to any biological product this year. And if we compare that across the network and trials conducted to date, We've been investigating different biological products for about three years now and have had only one negative response so far. So there are a lot of products that fall into this biological category and we are happy to accommodate more of these trial types across more years and environments. So if you're wondering if that product's gonna work in your fields, let's go ahead and let's test it out. Moving on, a different type of biological treatment our soybeans rely on. We had seven double versus single inoculant trials this year with one significant yield response near Dauphin. So for these trials, double inoculant is typically an on-seed inoculant plus something in furrow and a single inoculant is a seed applied inoculant alone. So in more detail, at that significant site, there was no difference in nodulation between double and single inoculant treatments. Both had excellent nodulation. This rating score is out of four here. Uh, yield was 
increased by just over two bushels an acre, which was enough to cover the cost of the granular inoculant and provide a profit. Uh, this year in these economics tables, uh, I just in our reports, they have two columns. So one is for a soybean cell price of 11 to $12 a bushel, and one is trying to capture the change in prices there of a soybean cell price of 13 to $15 a bushel. Uh, so when you see these economic tables in our reports, that's why there's gonna be multiple columns this year to try and capture the difference in the different price scenarios we've experienced. So across the network, we've hosted 46 double versus single inoculant trials since 2013. And we've had a significant yield response that provided a return on investment only 4% of the time. So it is important to mention here that all of these sites have had at least two and often three previous soybean crops that were well nodulated, effectively building that soil rhizobia population. So if moving to a single inoculant strategy is something you're curious in, we do have this checklist for moving to a single inoc based on field history largely. Uh, also note that there is a criteria for no significant drought. So We've been telling folks to consider using uh, granular or double inoculation strategy for this upcoming spring, considering that we've had some challenging conditions and a granular is a bit more resilient during a tough spring. But on the flip side of that, 2021 spring was quite dry. And it looks like in the majority of these trials, the liquid inoculant on its own performed quite well, along with the rhizobia that was built up in the soil. And that's interesting. Along the same theme, we had three single versus no inoculant trials last year, each with a different treatment. Um, so one was liquid and peat versus none, one was liquid versus eco tea versus none, and one liquid versus none. There were no nodulation nor yield differences among these treatments. Across the network so far, we've had 36 trials since 2016 comparing seed applied inoculant to bare seed and have not had a significant yield response yet. So far, these trials have been located in South Central Manitoba, where there's a quite a bit more soybean history, uh, but we would be able to expand these into the West now if there's interest. In these fields here, the soil rhizobia populations have been built up since all of these fields have had at least a minimum of three previous soybean crops. And looking at the field histories for these trials, at 83% of them, uh, soybeans had been grown within the last two years. So this Tight history might mean we can come back on inoculant, but it could also mean we're setting ourselves up for some disease and resistant weed problems down the road. Moving into soybean row spacing, we've got small plot research on this topic, but how does that shape up at the field scale? So last year we had four trials, two comparing seven and a half to 15 inches and two comparing 15 to 30 inches. So for the purposes of discussing this more broadly, I'm going to refer to row widths of seven and a half to 10 inches as narrow 15 to 20 is intermediate and 30 inches as wide. So to help inform what's going on in these trials, we collect canopy closure measurements to see how much bare ground is being left open for weeds. And it's also a measure of how much sunlight we're capturing. So this year plants were small and stunted and that's really showing up in these canopy measurements. So they were low across the board and on average, the 30 inch rows never fully closed this season. Um, so above 85% is kind of the threshold I'm using here to define row closure, uh, because the software can have some trouble beyond that, uh, differentiating between shadows and ground later in the season. Uh, so just to be aware of there, uh, comparing that to 2020, we pretty much had rows closed by R3 or potting in many cases. And you can really see the row differences at flowering already in this blue line. So lack of row closure this year even showed up on the NDVI imagery. So here's an example where you can see the 30 inch treatments from the sky. They're the ones with these big stripes <laughs> from above. Across the network, we have had 16 trials to date for row spacing. Uh, so this is a bit of a busy graph, so I'm gonna walk through it a bit. Uh, we had seven comparing narrow versus intermediate row widths and nine comparing intermediate 15s to a wide row of 30. I uh, do note that seeding rate was held constant over the row widths tested. At the narrow versus intermediate, we had three significant yield responses and comparing 15 inches to 30s, uh, there have been two yield responses so far. This is actually a bit more of a frequent yield response than the small plot research had previously suggested. Uh, but to just summarize that a 
bit more for, from this busy graph. Narrow rows provided a yield benefit over intermediates 43% uh, of the time, improving yield by just under two bushels per acre. An intermediate row width of 15 inches provided a yield benefit over 30s 22% of the time, improving yield by just over two bushels an acre. So we can't really quantify the economics of these trials more broadly, since how you'd achieve those changes in row spacing will really vary by farm and equipment. Soybean seeding rate. So we had 14 seeding rate trials last year, testing a range of 100,000 seeds per acre up to 215,000 seeds per acre. So there were no significant yield responses, um, but the general idea here is to test three seeding rates that vary by about 30,000 seeds an acre. So this is often the farmer's standard practice followed by 30,000 lower and, th and higher. So the actual rates for each trial are determined by what the farmer is most interested in. So we wanna make sure that we're answering each farmer's individual question first, and then drawing larger conclusions across the data set second. And across the data set so far for soybean seeding rate, uh, we can get kind of a sense for how often that seeding rate is making a difference for yield and our bottom line. So we see across our 100 trials in 10 years, about 80% of the time, soybean seeding rate isn't having a significant effect on yield. And when it does significantly affect yield, only 12% of the time is that yield response also economically favorable. And by that, I mean the increased seed cost was at least paid for by the increase in yield. Megan actually covered this really well in last year's webinar and in her videos. So I'm gonna direct you there for a full discussion on this topic, just in the interest of time. But after some careful comparisons of seeding rates, we kind of end up with these general conclusions and the understanding that somewhere in the neighborhood of 150,000 to 180,000 seeds per acre should be adequate to achieve full yield potential. And with the price of soybean seed, this will have a meaningful impact on your bottom line. Dropping below 150,000 seed per acre may not have shown a significant yield penalty, but it also introduces a lot of risk. The rest of our crop management just needs to be excellent in order to maximize yield potential once crop stands are dropping that like too low. So we will continue uh, asking this question with different seeding rate comparisons as long as farmers continue to be interested and we'll continue to see what we can learn as the data set keeps shifting and growing. And now moving into peas and some new trial types, we had one double versus single inoculant trial this year on a field with no pea history. So pea rhizobia is different from soybeans and it is native to our soils. So we can actually investigate the question of inoculant on fields with or without a history of peas. At this trial, nodulation was good to excellent for both treatments, and as a result, we didn't see a yield response. Another difference between peas and soybeans to be aware of is that it's a different nodulation rating score we're using over here. So pea nodules are indeterminate, meaning they branch as they grow and they form these kind of globular structures. So rather than individually counting nodules, we do use a rating card that it's going to account for above ground growth, the number of these clusters, and where they're located on the root system. So this trial just barely fell into the less effective nodulation category. Uh, there was no difference between treatments, and that kind of reduction in nodulation is expected to have been due to the dry conditions, which were especially apparent in this field. A second inoculant trial also investigated the rates of granular inoculant, comparing a normal rate to a double rate. So there were no significant nodulation or yield differences here either. Pea seeding rate trials were new this year. So something as we noticed as we were doing plant counts and fungicide trials over the last few seasons were that pea plant stands were kind of all over the place. And this led to the question of seeding rate in peas. So this graph is showing plant stands at R3 in plants per square foot in those fungicide trials over the last three years. So, and we were finding that they were almost never up to the recommended plant stand from the small plot research, which is seven to eight plants per square foot. However, we are seeing some good yields at what would be considered low plant stands. So this raised a couple questions for us. Are we leaving yield behind? And why are these plant stands so low? So in some cases, the seeding rates were just generally lower, 
but across the board, we were on average only seeing about 60% of the seed put into the ground becoming a re reproductive plant at R3. And that needs more investigation. So overall, these questions are really what drove our interest into pea seeding rate trials this year. And let's get into some of the information from those trials this year. So we had four trials that we could actually take to yield for pea seeding rate trials this year, and five that we have plant stand data for. Uh, so one we couldn't really get plant counts on since changing up seeding rates between passes just didn't really agree with the drill, resulted in plug lines, misses, and clumps. Um, there were no significant yield differences in these trials. Uh, yield was again driven by environment and moisture here, but I would like to dig into these results a little bit more because we've got research saying what we should be targeting for plant stand, and it's actually pretty rare that we're seeing that in the field. So what's going on? Uh, so looking a little bit more into how the plant stand progressed throughout the season, each uh, of these rows is a different trial. And for each of those um, trials, seed was sent out for germination testing, which is the second column here. And then based on plant counts, percent survivability was calculated at vegetative growth stages, or more effectively, what made it out of the ground and emerged, as well as survivability by the R stages. So what made it to produce yield in the end? On top of what we expected to lose based on germination, we saw about 12 to 20% that didn't emerge successfully. And then as the crop progressed into our stages, on average, we saw a loss of another 4% of plants. So for example, what that looks like, um, we'll take a look a little bit more in depth at this pea seeding rate before trial near Roland. So based on the 89% germination uh, for each seeding rate treatment down here, we'd expect to get a plant stand of the blue bars in a perfect world if just based on germination alone. The orange bars are what actually came out of the ground during B stages, and then the gray bars are what made it to the end of the season during those reproductive plant counts. So there are pretty big gaps between what we might expect from germination and what's actually coming out of the ground. So there's lots of factors that can come into play here. Uh, there's seed handling damage, drought, seedling diseases, cutworms, you name it. Um, but at the low seeding rate, We've also got some more mortality during the season. And this also happened in a couple of the other trials too. And again, that's a bit risky to me. So we might not have seen yield differences in these trials, but in stressful years, just how many plants can you afford to lose? Similar to those soybean seeding rate trials, the rest of your management just needs to be excellent to maximize yield potential. And also not measured here was lodging. So lower plant stands aren't gonna be able to hold each other up as well come harvest time. That's important to pay attention to. Uh, so I'm really excited to keep exploring this trial type in the future as we keep digging into pea plant stands. And then to quickly wrap up peas, we had four fungicide trials, three comparing a single application of fungicide versus none, and one comparing a double app to a single app. So in June this year, we did get one or two good rains in some areas, but it ultimately wasn't enough to create much disease pressure and yield wasn't influenced by a fungicide app in these trials this year. But ahead of these fungicide trials, we did use the Microsphorella blight fungicide decision worksheet to determine what kind of risk level there was for disease to develop. So this is a tool here that we recommend to farmers to make informed spray decisions. So we wanted to use it in these trials to inform ahead of spray timing what we thought the results might be. So uh, quickly working through this worksheet with the three single versus none fungicide applications this year. So each column is a different trial. We scouted the field ahead of flowering, rating the crop canopy and its density, the humidity in the field, accounting for the five day forecast, and looking for those microsphere blight symptoms. So we did this at a number of spots in the field, and that's why we're coming up with these kind of funky average numbers. But at most, we were really just seeing these light lesions in the lower canopy from Microsphorella, just these little light freckles. So on this worksheet, a 65 is considered the trigger for a fungicide. And when we add these scores all together, um, really not at much of a risk for disease developing this year. As the forecast changes, or if you're noticing symptoms creeping up the canopy when you're scouting, that's when it's time to revisit this checklist and see if it's going to push you over the edge. 
And once again, this resource is available on our website. You can search it on Google using MPSG P fungicide worksheet, or if you'd like a physical laminated copy you can take into the field, feel free to reach out to us. Uh, we also had two faba bean fungicide trials as well, testing single versus double applications. So these are each a summary of the two fields and their disease ratings for ascochyta, chocolate spot, and other blights. Uh, they were prevalent throughout the trials, which you can see from this incidence rating, it's quite high. Uh, however, it was at these really low severity levels. So an example of what that actually means from the trials at disease rating timing. Uh, so disease well present quite commonly, but it was really restricted to the lower canopy and just kind of some few lesions on the leaves. So we weren't really at much risk from disease damage here. Across the network, we have had three trials so far. So you are seeing most of the results here on this page already. There was quite a big yield bump last year. There was quite a bit of moisture throughout the season at that field, and it was a treated versus untreated trial. Just to round out fungicide, we also had two dry bean fungicide trials, one single versus no application and one single versus double app. So white mold wasn't present, in either trial, and as a result, no yield differences emerged. If we compare that to previous trials, so far we actually haven't had a response to fungicide and dry beans, but if we look at the last couple of years here, 2020, 2019, uh, the incidence in those trials has just been really low to zero so far. But that brings us into dry beans and some trials I want to show a couple more pictures on. So for dry bean tillage trials, we had two trials comparing strip till to conventional till, one in black beans and one in pintos. So both were located in south central Manitoba on wheat stubble in clay soils. Tillage treatments were established the prior fall. Uh, this year, as crops transitioned from vegetative to reproductive growth, there were noticeable differences. Um, so conventionally tilled beans were generally smaller and less vigorous compared to their strip till counterparts at both trials. And these differences persisted to maturity where the pinto beans were so green that they actually weren't able to be harvested. And since those conventional till strips couldn't be harvested, yield was effectively zero for those plots, um, making strip till the economical decision in this case. So total costs were calculated based on the fuel, labor, and operating costs for each tillage system. So you normally also wouldn't see this giant economic increase it's really just because we couldn't harvest that conventional till treatment. So the comparison is to zero there. At the black bean trial, on the other hand, uh, the differences in vegetative growth between treatments was more subtle, but still a bit noticeable. So both treatments were able to be harvested and strip till resulted in nearly a 300 pound per acre increase in yield over the conventionally tilled plots. And this is expected to be a result of moisture conservation here. Um, again, these black beans were also on 30 inch rows and you can still see those strips from the NDVI again, indicating those rows never fully closed. On to the economics, uh, here is the cost difference based on the farmer's fertilizer application, fuel and operating costs. So strip till had both the yield advantage as well as the advantage of being a bit cheaper to implement here resulting in a net increase in profit ranging anywhere from $66 an acre to $173 an acre, uh, depending on your black bean sell price. So black bean sell price ranging from 30 cents a pound to 60 cents a pound. And then moving into nitrogen fertility, we had one N trial in pinto beans in 2021. At the later vegetative stages, there were some visual differences where the zero N check strips were a bit paler uh, than the adjacent strips that had nitrogen applied. And these visual differences persisted through flowering, where we did see improved growth, vigor, and even advanced staging at the highest end rate here. This carried through to a significant difference in yield, where the highest rate of nitrogen, which in this case was 70 pounds per acre, increased yield by about 150 pounds per acre compared to the zero end check strips. Uh, next question is, was that 150 pounds enough to improve profitability? So here we've got the cost of those nitrogen treatments as uh, what prices have been like as a long-term average for urea uh, versus what prices were like at the time of putting the report together. So we're still trying to kind of account for those differences here. Uh, assuming those urea costs 
The yield increase was profitable, even assuming a black bean sell price as low as 35 cent, or 30 cents a pound. How that fits in across the network, we've had five dry bean nitrogen trials starting in 2019. Uh, there's also some complementary small plot research that has been ongoing at the Pulse and Soybean Agronomy Research Lab at the same time as these trials. So the first three sites here, we've had no significant yield response to nitrogen. And then at the fourth site, the highest end rate of 105 pounds per acre actually resulted in a decrease in yield. So the assumption there is that the rate in that year under those growing conditions just pushed vegetative growth too far and the seed didn't have time to fill. That's kind of the working theory for now. But to answer why we weren't seeing responses, this year we started taking regular soil samples of this trial type. And those soil samples have given us some insight to what went on this season. So why did the 2021 trial behave so differently? Well, it's probably going to come down to growing season conditions. So something we were starting to wonder about and actually started to indirectly track in the last season was the potential contribution of mineralized nitrogen to dry bean and nutrition throughout the season. So last year was exceptionally dry and mineralization isn't a very prominent process under those conditions. So we saw this reflected in the samples we took throughout the season where we have pretty stable nitrate levels in the top 12 inches. And this is the year where we also saw a yield response with N fertilizer. So we do need to track this in other seasons with different conditions to round out this theory, but it is a good example of the value that can come from asking the same question under different conditions and over multiple years. Uh, so those were the 2021 results with a bit of a peek into how they fit into the results so far across the network. Um, looking forward to this upcoming growing season, we do have a range of trial types we're interested in testing, and we also hope you are as well. So one trial I would like to start in peas is investing the, investigating the question of pea seed treatment. So pea survivabilities have been low. Uh, first question, will a seed treatment improve the number of plants that make it out of the ground? We also now know that we've got pea leaf weevils more commonly across Manitoba. So their populations or levels are currently low enough that we wouldn't expect a seed treatment to be an economical decision, but at what point will they be? And the other question is, does protecting pea seedlings from early season root rots and seedling diseases translate into yield at the end? So those are a couple of questions on why I'd like to get uh, that trial type started. Um, but if there is a product or practice not on this list, or if you're interested in testing out one of these trial types on your farm, please do reach out to us. And here is our contact information. Uh, I would like to thank you for your time today. So I've been Laura, your MPSG production specialist, and here is Leanne's contact information for anyone more interested in the trials or participating. And then on the side here, we do have our links to the results database and summary videos I was talking about as well. So do feel free to reach out if there's any questions, uh, you're looking for more information or you want any of those resources I talked about today. Thanks. Thanks, Laura. Um, again, if you have any questions for Laura, please type them into the question and answer box and we can get to them at the end of the webinar. Um, so next up, we have Jordan Karpinchik of Tone Egg Consulting. Jordan's going to cover some of the spring wheat and barley results from the 2021 growing season, um, as well as cover some longer term results. So over to you, Jordan. Hi, good morning. Um, I'm just about to share my screen here. Give me one second. Okay. And okay, how's uh, we got the right screen up there? Everybody seeing what they should be seeing, I hope. Yes, I think you're good to go. Perfect. Okay. All right. Good morning, everyone. Um, I'm here to talk about the wheat and barley uh, portion of the uh, Manitoba Crop Alliance uh, Research on the Farm uh, trials. Uh, again, my name is uh, Jordan Karpinchik uh, with Tone Eye Consulting, and uh, let's get started. So what we're going to cover today is a brief overview of all the 2021 wheat and barley results um, with a bit more of a focus on the wheat seed treatment trials that we've been running the past couple of years and the kind of an update on the um, uh, plant growth regulator uh, trials that have been running uh, since 2018. 
So for 2021, um, we had 36 sites uh, in um, across the province. Uh, obviously, as many of you know, there was uh, definitely some challenges to this growing season uh, in terms of weather conditions, uh, especially in the Interlake and Central Manitoba, um, where yields uh, in the cereals um, definitely were um, uh, lacking. Uh, that's kind of an understatement, but uh, you know, some of our sites uh, were, were in that to 15 acre for spring wheat. Um, with that being said, rainfall ranged uh, from about um, 117, 163 millimeters with an average of 145 millimeters of rain. Uh, and that runs from May to August. So uh, in general, across our wheat uh, and barley sites, that's about 66% uh, of normal uh, for cereal uh, growing. So let's get started with the wheat seeding rate trial. So that was new for 2021. Uh, we had six sites um, in the province. Uh, seeding rate uh, differences had to be a minimum of 25 pounds an acre over the producer's uh, normal check seeding rate. As you can kind of see there, it ranged from about 110 to 135 pounds per acre. Um, our target plant stands uh, generally for, for spring wheat uh, would be in that uh, 25 to 30 plants per uh, square foot. Um, whereas you can see there, for the most part, uh, even our low seeding rates, we're still able to achieve uh, close to that 25 uh, plants per square foot range. Um, we did have three of our six sites showed a statistical difference between plant stands. So uh, what that kind of tells us is that, you know, we always kind of struggle with you know, for a seeding rate trial, like what's the minimum range that needs to happen before we'll actually see a difference uh, after emergence? As you guys know, germination, uh, um, there, or there can be some differences in germination and things like that, obviously with weather. Um, but we did actually, I was uh, kind of impressed to see our, uh, some of our higher seeding rates. So pushing that uh, close to that three bushels uh, an acre, we were able to see, you know, 40 plus uh, plants per square foot, which of course, uh, our staff at uh, Tone Ag had a lot of fun uh, counting all those ones there. But uh, at any rate, uh, of those uh, uh, sites in terms of yield, two of the six showed a statistical difference between yields. Uh, you'll see in the low seeding rate uh, category at a kind of a low yielding site uh, in gray, we, we did see a, a positive yield uh, advantage for the lower seeding rate. Uh, and same with the um, uh, site in Woodlands. Uh, where their lower seeding rate in that case would have been about 90, uh, 90 or 95 pounds per acre, um, out yielded the, uh, the other two seeding rates. So what that looks like in terms of economic analysis um, at those two sites that did have a, a response uh, um, to uh, the low seeding rate, uh, they basically saved $8 an acre in seed costs, uh, netting them um, about $41 more of net profit. So we're, we're kind of excited to see uh, what maybe a little bit more rain will do uh, in terms of uh, a growing season in, uh, in 2022 um, when we continue these trials. So just a brief look at uh, wheat fusarium head plate uh, timing. Uh, we had four sites in the province this year. Uh, as most of you are aware, uh, fusarium was not on the top of the uh, concern uh, uh, for most uh, producers, just because they're, it was very hard to find. Um, so as you uh, might understand here, uh, our late timing, early timing of fungicide versus our untreated, there was no statistical yield difference between uh, any of the uh, treatments at any of the sites. And when we're looking at our seed samples that we, uh, we took at harvest, uh, we had no difference. Our, our dawn numbers were all uh, below the detection level. Um, our protein Numbers, of course, uh, range from about 12 and a half to 18 percent, which is uh, uh, definitely uh, something that you normally see when you have uh, a bit less moisture and a bit more nitrogen. Uh, um, uh, basically, that isn't utilized and kind of stuck in the plant there, and uh, that gives us an average of 16.1 percent uh, for protein this year. Again, no differences uh, between uh, any of them. So for 2021, uh, we continued uh, the second year of the malt barley uh, variety trials that we're working with uh, a collaboration with CMBTC uh, and also the end users. Um, they'll be able to see the, the data like maltsters, buyers, things like that. So roughly 5% of Canadian malting barley uh, is produced in Manitoba. 
Um, you know, about 90% uh, or the bulk of it is in Alberta, but uh, we definitely still, uh, I believe it's around uh, set about 500,000 tons uh, normally per year. Um, we've had seven different varieties um, chosen to be grown in these trials uh, since uh, 2020. Uh, and for more detailed information on the barley quality results that CNBTC took uh, with the seed samples we collected at harvest, uh, there is a really nice article in the winter edition of Focal Point. I advise uh, everyone to, to take a look at that if you have any interest in, um, uh, in malting uh, in malt barley. So just a quick uh, overview of our um, sites this year. We had five that were seeded. Unfortunately, we did lose one to drought. Um, the farmer wasn't able to uh, to swath the uh, strips in the same direction as the planter, or as the air seeder, I'm sorry, um, just because they, they would fall through. Uh, so, but at the end of the day, we were able to harvest uh, four of the sites, um, three of them with uh, normal to slightly above average yields. Uh, one of them, our Wesley Gladstone site, uh, definitely um, on, the, on the lower end, uh, uh, but it was still nice to be able to see there was some uh, varietal differences there um, for, for that particular farmer to see that. Uh, only one variety, uh, the bow, would fail to meet uh, malting quality. So germ uh, has to be above 95% um, to, uh, to achieve malt. Uh, so it was 94.5. So, I mean, um, it was close, but it just wasn't uh, quite there. Uh, there was statistical differences between uh, generally the synergy uh, and the other varieties at the other two sites. Um, Synergy is uh, kind of the becoming the standard for malting, malting barley um, when in terms of variety selection. Um, there was some high proteins, as you can imagine, as we talked about spring wheat, barley was no different. Uh, due to the drought, uh, malting companies, uh, especially adjunct brewers that uh, like uh, Anheuser-Busch that use um, adjuncts such as corn and rice, things like that, were able to blend in uh, the, the barley uh, pretty easily. Um, especially because there was such a demand for it and there was supply uh, wasn't as bountiful as normal. Uh, so we have one year left on this project uh, in partnership with uh, CMB. And just a couple of pictures that we took of the same site, uh, same strip. So this was our site in Wawanesa. Uh, we have uh, AAC Connect on the left and Fraser on the right uh, of those images. We, we did see a color um, and maturity uh, difference uh, throughout most of the season between those two varieties, but it ended up uh, being the statistically the same yield. Uh, sometimes when we see a bit of a delay, I know in our 2020 site um, with Goldman, we, we saw a bit of a uh, uh, same sort of thing, like a color difference and kind of a delay. We did That's where we did see uh, quite a bit of a yield penalty, but uh, for whatever reason, um, it was more just visual than uh, anything else. Okay, so focusing on uh, a little bit more of a detailed um, portion of our segment here with the wheat seed treatment. We'll start with that one. So Manitoba Crop Alliance has made it a priority to uh, quantify the agronomic and economic impacts of using um, a seed treatment on uh, plant to survival, uh, quality and yield of uh, spring wheat. Uh, so to date, the 90% of the trials in our uh, uh, that our, our trial sites have used uh, fungicide seed treatment only with no insecticide component. So over the past few years, two out of 17 trials, uh, one in 2020 and one in 2021, uh, or 11% have shown a statistical difference in yield uh, due to the use of a fungicide seed treatment. Plant stands have been uh, basically the same as you can see there, you know, 24.6 to 24.7. Uh, so we're not seeing uh, really any early season, um, you know, uh, root rots or things like that that have caused uh, any reduction uh, in, in the plant stands uh, after emergence uh, in the untreated uh, strips. We're basically uh, flatline on there. Also uh, protein, another thing that we've uh, measured with that after harvest, um, again, um, no statistical difference there. Um, so basically, uh, it is important to note that you know, obviously the last couple of years, we haven't had a lot of um, uh, moisture after seeding, especially in May. You know, if, if the wheat, uh, like I say, in, in some of this, these trials this year was seeded uh, kind of mid-April, um, and we didn't have much rainfall until kind of the May long weekend. 
So again, we're not seeing that uh, really heavy pressure early on uh, like we would have maybe in uh, 2014 and 15. Uh, one of the sites uh, that did respond, this was uh, up uh, near Dauphin in 2020. Uh, we did see that noticeable uh, color difference basically from emergence until mid-July, um, but no real detectable early season differences in, in disease levels uh, or plant stands for that matter. The plant stands were almost identical, uh, but we did get a yield difference of four bushels per acre. Uh, so in, in this case, uh, unlike the barley I showed previously, this uh, turned out to um, be statistically different and also uh, um, yield uh, about four bushels uh, an acre. But looking at economics, out of the two sites that have responded to seed treatment, um, it, the average about 2.6 bushels per acre, uh, with the cost of that fungicide uh, seed treatment at about seven to 750 per acre based on uh, two bushel seeding rate. Uh, wheat prices, of course, uh, definitely not where they were uh, a few years back, but uh, I'm using the uh, current numbers that I've been told uh, were roughly around that uh, 11 to 13 bushels per acre mark. So we're looking at a net profit of 24 20 an acre when it does uh, increase. Okay, and switching gears to the plant growth regulator trials, uh, MCA has made it a priority to um, look at uh, plant growth regulators and their effects on height, yield, and milling quality of spring wheat and barley in Manitoba. Uh, so far, we've had uh, four products, uh, products used to date. As you can see below there, Easy Grow K, Manipulator 620, Modus, which was new for 2021, and Omex Liquid K Extra, which is a, um, a, their PGR with, uh, with a little bit of uh, potassium fertilizer. So Manipulator, um, or this is thanks to Belgium Canada here, this is the Manipulator chart. I'm sure you guys have seen this uh, over the years. It's not a new product anymore, but uh, it's still important to, to kind of go through. So for our trials, uh, we were kind of targeting that early stem elongation at uh, growth stage 30 to 32. Uh, for most of our sites, we did have a few that, uh, that decided to do a split uh, with their uh, herbicide and then come back in at uh, flag leaf timing. We had a few sites that uh, tried that out just to see if that was a better fit instead of making that separate trip uh, across the field. Uh, but generally, you know, your window is basically um, from about leaf to flag. Uh, for, for products like manip, uh, Manipulator and, and Modus, uh, uh, actually all of them to, for, the most, uh, for the most part. And that's just a picture of a couple, you know, when we were just before, to, uh, just, when we were out there just before we sprayed, um, again, targeting that early stem elongation for, for the best timing. But one thing that we noticed this year, uh, we had about 12 days to apply uh, our plant growth regulators uh, for our sites that we had selected. Um, you know, make sure that temperatures uh, don't get above 28, uh, even an hour or so like uh, after application. I mean, uh, generally it's the same thing for uh, most herbicides and fungicides, but uh, just to avoid uh, any risk of crop damage. But one thing that we did kind of look back and notice was that uh, almost half of the days in our window, uh, temperatures were above 30 degrees Celsius this year. Uh, so it's just something that uh, to keep in mind if you are uh, planning to use these products uh, that just make sure you follow the label and, uh, and all the guidelines and try your best to, to uh, spray in um, uh, when temperatures uh, are, you know, around that 20 to 25 uh, mark, I guess I would say. So for plant height, um, you know, for our treated strips, so this is a, basically a snapshot across all the uh, trials, uh, about 44 sites, I believe it is. Um, 73 centimeters on average for our uh, treated uh, strips or that you've used uh, the PGRs and 78 centimeters for untreated. So on average, we are seeing about uh, 4.7 centimeter uh, height difference. And what that means is, you know, when you look overall across the, uh, the uh, 44, 45 sites, uh, we are seeing, um, you know, uh, definitely a benefit uh, of about 53% of the time uh, we are reducing, uh, uh, had a significant height reduction use of the PGR. Uh, but when you look all across all trials, there is still a, uh, uh, a difference uh, across the, when you compare all the sites. 
So lodging is one of those things where, you know, when you look at the labels and look at all the, the research that's been done on these products, like this is definitely where the strong point is uh, or, or where you should be using these um, products when you have, you know, high fertility combined with uh, maybe a higher seeding rate and also with uh, uh, the potential for heavy moisture, uh, especially at uh, um, head emergence and flowering. So we've only had four sites since 2019 uh, that have had any significant lodging in the trial. Um, you know, so ratings uh, we do from uh, one to 10 for severity and uh, uh, our rating on a percent of course incidence level. Uh, in the four cases that we did see uh, lodging, um, the PGR definitely reduced uh, the incidence and severity uh, of that law. It's just a, a picture of the um, our site uh, near uh, Crystal City in 2020, um, um, taking kind of uh, just. So another place that we did see um, is kind of a snapshot of the uh, NDVI drone imagery that we fly uh, every year. Of course, this was done on July 17th. Uh, this was our Wawanesa site. Um, as you can see on the left, uh, the RGB image on the left, you can really see uh, where the uh, PGR uh, was applied and where it wasn't um, in terms of the uh, uh, reflectance uh, from the uh, drone, uh, uh, yeah, from the drone uh, sensors. Uh, so this trial resulted in three and a half bushel increase in yield. Uh, the main thing that to take away from this is that un the untreated strips can only be combined in one direction. Uh, without risk of uh, severe losses due to the lodged wheat. So this is a situation, yeah, three and a half. I mean, it, it, it sounds, it doesn't sound like very much, but uh, in terms of production and timing, like uh, if you had to harvest this whole field, uh, uh, only one direction, you guys know how long that would, uh, that would basically double your uh, harvest time, right? So it's, uh, th this is definitely um, uh, the place where it's really shone uh, uh, using a PGR. A uh, place where it, uh, I struggled a little bit this year. We had two sites that used uh, MODIS, um, two barley sites. Uh, the barley heads did not fully emerge uh, from the boot in the treated strips. And we did see uh, quite a significant yield decline uh, kind of in that five to 10 bushel range uh, in both sites uh, due to the extreme heat drought after the PGR application. So something to kind of, as and, and this is not just in our sites. I know I heard uh, rumors and reports from across the province. Um, it's just something to, Keep in mind, uh, if, if weather forecasts are, are looking hot and dry, um, it might not be the, uh, the, the best time to use uh, MODIS. I mean, it definitely, definitely shortened the barley. There's no doubt about that. Um, but uh, it also uh, kept the, um, the heads from fully emerging. So for, uh, yeah, uh, looking at yield, we had a statistical difference, uh, 7 out of 14, 7 out of 44 trials, sorry, or 16% of the time. Um, overall, we're, we're not, we're only seeing about a bushel and a half between all the sites. Um, but, um, again, uh, I have to stress that, uh, uh, relatively dry conditions combined with, uh, almost no lodging, um, it, it kind of makes sense. We're not seeing it, uh, more often a response. In terms of quality, uh, one thing that uh, was a bit of a concern uh, early on was, uh, protein levels. Uh, being negatively affected, uh, I can happily report that our treated average and untreated average is 14.2% across those sites, so no difference there. And also uh, some milling uh, data, so we sent a bunch of seed samples to uh, uh, the Canadian Inter International Grains Institute there in 2019 and 20. Uh, they see no differences in milling yields uh, between treatments for the Brandon, Cardiel, and Faller. Uh, we actually had an increase, I believe, with Rowan. Um, and uh, the treatments uh, with PGR did not impact uh, overall flower uh, performance or quality, uh, which is great for our end users. Uh, again, there was a little bit of worry uh, coming from our millers and, um, and, uh, and bakers for that matter, that uh, um, anytime you tinker around with, uh, or potentially tinker around with something, uh, they, they're always a bit uh, concerned. So it was nice to show, show that uh, there was no uh, no impact uh, on, on, on flower production. Uh, so for in terms of yield response, so the sites that did uh, respond positively we would average about four bushels an acre uh, with an average cost of a product uh, $15, application $8 an acre. And again, we price 12, so we're looking at a 
positive net return uh, on those sites uh, at $25. So some acknowledgements, uh, Manitoba Crop Alliance, of course, um, the farmer cooperators that have, you, know, you guys have made this, uh, all this work possible. So thank you uh, for that. Uh, Agvise Laboratories for running all our uh, um, soil samples and uh, doing all the analysis there. Uh, Belgium and uh, Canada, Syngenta Canada uh, for donating uh, product uh, over the years and uh, Sigi. And I believe that is it. Uh, there's our contact information there for Daryl, uh, the research trial specialist with MCA, and then also my contact information. And then again, we'll hold questions till, uh, till uh, after Morgan is finished. Thank you. Awesome. Thanks, Jordan. Um, so we are approaching 11 o'clock, but I hope that you guys will all stick with us um, as we welcome Morgan Cott, our agronomy extension specialist for special crops with MCA. So over to you, Morgan. Thanks, Mallory. Um, hope this is the correct screen. Looks great. Okay, thank you. I usually put the wrong one up. Um, so yeah, thanks, Mallory. I'm Morgan Cotton, the Agronomy Extension Specialist for Special Crops with the MCA. So I'll be discussing our results for our research on the farm trials uh, with our special crops. Our special crops trials include sunflower planting rate, which was in its first year of data collection last year. We continued with the corn planting rate trials for year two and 21. So I'll be reviewing both um, data sets for these crops. And I'll um, give a wrap, a little wrap up both what MCA has for research on the farm trials planned in 2022. So as I said, this is our first year having the sunflower planting rate trial with the purpose of quantifying the agronomic and economic impacts of both increasing and decreasing the normal planting rate for sunflowers on any given farm. Typically, sunflower planting rates don't get played around with too often because um, it does include a greater risk than most crops just because of the already low planting rates. Um, but producers are interested in knowing what the best planting rate is for their operations. So this trial is needed one and has given us pretty interesting results for the first year. Um, decreasing the planting rates can increase the sunflower head size due to lower competition, but that not, might not be a good thing um, depending on plant stock strength. Alternatively, increasing planting rates will likely decrease head size and we need to know that fine line of reaching the right balance between population and greatest achievable yield. Um, this trial helps us determine what the ideal planting space is for the given variety. And also it's important to work, um, to do this work when environment isn't ideal so that we learn what planting rates work and what kind of conditions. Trial setup is very simple and is the same in both our corn and sunflower planting rates, planting rate trials. Um, every grower has the planting rate that works for them on um, or that they regularly use. So we take that specific rate to the grower and then take a planting rate um, about 3,000 PPA higher and 3,000 PPA lower or plants per acre lower. These will be the three planting rates that we choose or that the producer has chosen. Um, and if the producer is interested in pushing a little bit more, they can do that and they have done that in these trials. But um, most do vary by plus or minus 3,000 plants per acre planting rate. The setup on this slide um, was designed for an oilseed producer, and you can see how the planting rates are randomized on the side image here. And the planting rate for confects will be lower than this as they normally are for uh, populations. Here we're looking at the results for year one of the oilseed trials. We had six sites in 2021. You can see the RM here that each site was in, um, the producers check planting rate in the third column. And next you can see the um, plant, final plant stand measured at V2. We do have the one site location this season that did um, yield some statistically significant data from both plant stand and yield. The RM of Stuart Burns site, um, you can see the two higher planting rates were very similar, but higher than the low rate. Also notice how much lower the plant stand is than the planting rate. The check rate was 25,000 plants per acre here and they achieved um, 19,750 plants per acre. Um, so yield was the highest in the check rate, but not by much over the high planting rate. 
and there was a significant yield increase over the low planting rate. One more thing to note for each trial is that row spacing does vary across all of the sites. Um, in our sunflower trials, we have four sites that were on 20 inch centers, one that was on 22 and three that were on 30 inch center centers for all the eight sunflower trials. We had the six oils here and two more confect trials. So let's look at this trial site in a little bit more depth. Um, this is the data that we've taken away just from the RMF Stuart Burns site, which was the one site that yielded those statistical, um, statistically significant differences. Um, all these individual site data sets are available on our website. So you can look at each page as is um, right on our website to have a better look. But so just to run through the data that we have here, um, the site was near Pansy, previous crop was soybeans on a coarse loam, planted May 1st. Um, fertility was 70, 70, uh, 0, 0, 72. Um, row spacing was 30 inches. You can see the three planting rates um, that, that this producer chose. October 20th was a harvest date. And so um, in this table here, you can see the planting rates, 22, 25, 28, and the plants per acre, the actual plant, um, plant stand count at V2. Um, then below we have the quality data. Um, dockage was minimal, moisture was very consistent, thousand kernel weight was consistent, and then the sizing um, was fairly consistent. Oops. Um, and then here we just have the same chart that you're gonna be looking at in the graph here. Um, the 22,000 plants per acre yield about 2,500 pounds um, and so on. And also interesting, Data for this year, of course, was a rainfall. Um, this site was at, I think, about 76% of normal rainfall. Um, a summary on each trial, significant difference in yield of 3,000 plus pounds per acre between the 25 and 28,000 seeds per acre versus the 22,000. There was a significant difference in plant stands between the three planting rates. There was also some seed that um, blew and was stranded at the soil surface. So that's the reason that you're gonna be seeing um, these big drops in actual plant stand in comparison to the uh, planting rate. Now we have a look at the sec at the two convectionary sunflower sites. Notice the lower initial planting rates in the third column here um, that are conducive to confect fields. Both sites did have st st statistically significant differences in plant stands between the three different planting rates, but just the one site had yields that were st statistically significant. So let's have a closer look here. Um, this one, this field was also planted on soybean um, stubble, planted on May 14th, has really good fertility. Row spacing was on 22 inches. You can see his three planting rates. Um, and harvest date. So the three planting dates got decently close with their actual plant stand, um, a little bit better than the other trial, but still we would be hoping for better, but um, dry conditions obviously didn't allow that very well this year. Rainfall, I think at this site was approximately 82% of normal. Um, and then we have some good quality data here. So um, generally speaking, this uh, check rate at 65 or 16,500 16, plants per acre um, yielded the biggest um, seeds, green. Here we're looking at the first oil seed site that had statistically significant uh, data at the arm of Stuart Burn site. We're seeing the cost per acre of the seed, then the yields and pounds per acre beside. Next, we'll see the actual net profit per acre. And in the red, you can see that the check planting rate of 25,000 plants per acre achieved the highest return. Um, remember that this site had lower plant stands than the planting rate because of poor um, planting conditions and loss of seed. We don't have too many conclusions to draw from this trial in 2021. The reason being it was very dry, so it looked like Decreasing plant populations would improve the soil water utilization, of course, um, but it's really hard to know what that perfect balance is between environment and appropriate planting rate to achieve the most economical return. 
Um, at the bottom of the slide here, you'll see where you can find the individual site data for sunflower trials from 2021 on the MCA website. Moving on to our green corn planting, um, planting rate trials, these have the same purpose at the end of the day to quantify agro agronomic and economic impacts of both reducing and increasing their planting rates. Green corn producers do play around with planting rates more often than sunflower, sunflower producers will. Uh, we know that hybrids respond differently to plant populations and genetically work better or are built better for specific populations. They'll have their best performance in certain spacing, spacing between plants, which is also defined by row spacing. And of course, the optimum planting rates change with environmental conditions. Trial setup is the exact same as in sunflower populations. We just have higher planting rates here. The producer chooses the check rate and then decides on the high and low planting rates from here. And each trial is different because each producer and operation is different. Um, also, we have several row spacing, um, in all these trials as well, we range from 10 inches, there's 10, 20, 22, and 30 inch spacings. This is an overview of all 12 sites that we had in 21. You're not gonna see any red here because there was no, uh, no sites that had statistically significant set of data of any kind. So that was fun for us. <laughs> um, just choosing one site randomly here, um, this one was in the arm of Broken Head near Bozier, also on soybean uh, stubble. Planted May 3rd, good fertility, 20 inch row spacing. Here are his planting rates. Um, we have the soil properties. And then you can see how his planting rates stood up to the final plant stand. So he, he planted 29,032 and 35, and he did pretty good for planting populations or um, final stones. Rainfall was poor. A lot of it fell in the later um, part of the year. He had about 66, I think, percent of normal was his rainfall. Um, so no significant difference in yield or plant stands and feed two between the three planting um, populations and rainfall was well below normal. So this trial, was in its second year of data in 2021, I wanted to show the difference in the two years of data. The site locations and cooperators are not the same and will not necessarily be the same next year either. 2020 data is at the top of the table here. Um, there were only four sites that got significant data. And even if you look closely at this data, the yields don't vary a whole lot at each site. And this data is all um, also available on our website for both years. And you can um, find the link below. Conclusions drawn from the corn planting rate data are identical to sunflowers. 2021 was extremely dry. We um, just didn't see the yields react to planting rates. Decreasing planting rates does improve soil water utilization, um, but it's hard to know what that perfect balance is between environment and population. Finally, just a quick review of MCA's plans for research on the farm trials in 2022. We're continuing seven trials um, on from 2021 and prior, and also adding three new trials this spring, which will be the spring wheat enhanced efficiency fertilizer, um, barley seeding rates, and also flax seeding rates. So looking at this, if you have any interest in participating in one or more of these trials for 2022, please contact Jordan um, at Toneg. He'll be happy to have volunteers get in touch with him about these trials. Thank you. Awesome, thanks Morgan. So I don't see any unanswered questions in the chat for, or in the question and answer box, but at this point, if anybody has any questions for Laura or Jordan or Morgan, please type them in and we can answer them. There was a few for Laura that she answered right in the Q&A box. But also, if we're good to and the webinar here, then that's totally fine too. Mm -hmm. If you guys have any questions, please reach out to, to myself or Morgan or Jordan or, or Laura individually and, and we can chat offline. Thanks for tuning in everybody.